All right, Noel, welcome. And thanks for taking the time to chat. I really appreciate it. I know a lot of people in the San Filippo world know, know of you, have seen your TikTok videos. You've raised uh, awareness across millions of viewers out there using TikTok as a platform. Your son, Logan, I think he's, uh, what, 16? San Felipe yep. Syndrome Type A. We're in the state of Washington. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to learn more about you personally. You know, we've learned a lot about your son and you've raised a lot of awareness about the disease. You know, how you got into this TikTok advocacy campaign that you've been on for a while. And a little about your personal life, your home life, and, and where you kind of see yourself maybe going, you know, in the years ahead. Noel, let's let's start from the beginning. Where were you born? All that good stuff. Sure. Um, I was actually born in Frankfurt, Germany. My dad was in the army. So I lived there for the first nine years of my life. Then we moved from there to Texas for a little bit. Then after that, North Carolina and back to Texas. And all your moving was through his military career? And then... Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. When we lived in Germany, we moved like a total five times throughout the country. But... Yeah. um. And then, and then we moved to Texas after that. Okay. That's so interesting because I just talked to another San Filippo mom from Texas whose parent, whose father actually chased oil across the country. It was <laughs> like an oil family, but it was kind of similar because they kind of ended up yeah. in Texas. You said in Texas, you guys ended up or no? We did. Yeah. We, we ended up in Texas. Then we moved one more time to North Carolina, but then back to Texas and then Texas became home. So you grew up there, went to school in Texas? Um, yes. Okay. Most of middle school and all of high school in Texas. What kind of student were you? What kind of personality did you have back then? I was an okay student. I think maybe my junior and senior year, I was pretty much just done with school. I had a job and I was more interested in my job, but I did play, I played high school sports. I played soccer and I ran cross country. You still ever play soccer? From time to time. Yeah. We have an indoor soccer place here sometimes, but I don't have a whole lot of time for that with all the other things we're doing. I run more than anything. I happen to play men's soccer, men's 35 plus league. It's every Thursday night, but it's so nice to have that one night reserved for just me. Yeah. That, that is so crucial. My mental health just to know I have like all right, that's what I'm doing tonight. I'm getting it all out on the field. So you've been a runner as well? Yeah, I love running. Like the way you were just talking about soccer, that's how it is for running for me. Yeah. I have to get that in, if I can, every morning. Do you run with other people or is that your alone time? Nope, that's my alone time. Headphones or quiet? Oh, always music. I have to have music. I need that beat. What kind of music? Electronic music. So it's not yep. like a mix between like Biggie Smalls and something else? It's like... You got your own style you stick with? I, like dubstep. <laughs> well, eventually you ended up in Washington State. So now take yes. me from Texas to Washington. Billy, my husband, and I, we knew each other in high school. Uh -huh. We were acquaintances, but it was really after high school that we got to know each other because we were working at the same place. I was actually going to college at the time. We had been together for about two years. We got engaged and then had a surprise pregnancy. And I was so sick during that pregnancy, I ended up having to drop out of college. Billy actually joined the Navy. And that's how we ended up moving from Texas after he enlisted in the Navy. We actually ended up in South Carolina. We had Aiden, our daughter. And about 13 months after Aiden, we had the twins, Logan and Austin. We were in South Carolina for a little while. Billy got picked up for a commissioning program. That's when you go from enlisted and you become an officer. Um, they sent him to university. The Navy sent him to University of Texas. So we got to go back home mm -hmm. for a few years. And during that time is when Logan got his diagnosis. So after that diagnosis, that's when I came across the poor blood transplant. So Billy took a little break from school and we both went up to North Carolina for that whole entire six month process. So back up one sec, you and Billy yeah. are in Texas. You have, you have Aiden, 
and now you just you have two twins is he like out on a boat most of this time or is he on land because he's at at school or what okay so he yeah so it initially because he he had just enlisted he was still doing the initial schooling it's called the pipeline and that can be up to a year long before they get sent out to boats and going out to sea but during that time while going through the pipeline, he was picked up for the commissioning program. And that's when they sent us to Texas so he could get his degree at University of Texas. And that was when Logan was diagnosed. He was still going to school and luckily they allowed him to come to North Carolina for the transplant uh, process and everything. And then back to Texas to finish his schooling. And then that's when we were sent. This is so confusing. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. They're all confusing we were, stories. So we were sent back to South Carolina so he could go through the pipeline again as an officer. Okay. And after that is how when we ended up in Washington. And that's when he ended up on his first boat. So your whole life is basically been bouncing around Army, then Navy, right? So you're just yes. so used to that life. Yeah. And I was just, I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, I don't think I can ever be the type of person that will be able to settle because of it. We've been here in Washington for 10 years and I have that itch, like it's time to move soon. If you were to move, would you want to move out of the country or stay put? Have you ever thought about that? Like, Oh, we thought about it. So we'll never be able to move out of the country. The military won't move us because of Logan's diagnosis, because they want to make sure wherever they move us, mm -hmm. he is able to get the care he needs and yeah. they won't be able to provide the care that he needs in another country. But if we had that opportunity, absolutely. We would love to go to like Japan or Italy, anywhere like that. But for now, because of Logan's diagnosis, we'll definitely be staying within this country. How do you get diagnosed so early? I give most of the credit to his pediatrician, who is very persistent. But the reason we saw the initial red flags was because we were able to compare him to his twin brother. Austin was hitting milestones. Austin was talking. Austin wasn't having the same medical issues Logan was, the respiratory illness and the GI issues. So when we took that to his pediatrician, she was like, oh, let's get you to all these specialists. All these specialists, you know, they did their separate thing. The GI doctor couldn't figure out what was going on. Finally, his pediatrician was like, you know, this is more than just these separate issues. This is full body. So then she ended up sending us to geneticists. And that's when we got the diagnosis. And it was, he was about two and a half years old when he got that diagnosis. He's a fraternal twin, I assume. Yes. Do you happen to know of other twins in San Felipe world? And how common is it for one to have it and one not to? I mean, I guess the numbers, the odds are the one in four per kid, unless they're identical. Is that right? Exactly. And I've actually looked into this because this is a really common question. There are quite a few families who have fraternal twins. There's actually a few who have identical twins as well. I think two families I know of. There's no like hard data on it. Yeah. Um, all we have is like anecdotal evidence of, on it, but like, I don't, I don't think it's very common. I, um, but when it's fraternal twins, it's still going to be just the one in four chance because they are two separate kids. They just happen to be born at the same time when it's identical. If one has San Filippo, the other is going to have San Filippo too, because they share the same exact DNA. So you're in Washington state at this point, right? What's kind of like your day-to-day -day life over the next few years as you're kind of dealing with this diagnosis and managing life with three kids? And is it mostly uh, just you or the two of you, Billy, was he around much at all or what? It was really difficult at first because Billy was always there because he wasn't on sea duty and he wasn't going out to a boat. And we just, we got here and he left within a week. He had to leave. And that was hard. The Navy has some good supports. Uh, they're not great at putting it out there. So I really had no idea what I could tap into at the time. I didn't know anyone. 
I had to get all everything. It's every time you move, you have to start over with doctors, therapies, just everything. And it was very difficult because we had just left having a whole support system. But as time went on, it it got easier as I got Logan into his new doctors, his new therapies and getting him into that. We also gained support with that. And then whenever he goes to a boat, it's a whole new family. We always have uh, people like that surrounding us and helping us. One amazing thing that the Navy provides us with is 40 hours a month of respite. So we have an awesome respite provider. And that also helps, you know, give me time for self-care, but also time to spend with Logan's siblings one-on-one. Throughout these past 10 years we've been here, Billy, he goes to sea duty for a good three years. And that's going, being on a boat and going in and out. And then he has a good two, two and a half years of shore duty. And it just kind of switches. What Logan had done, what is called a cord blood transplant, it's very similar to a bone marrow transplant. It actually is pretty much the same thing, except that they, instead of bone marrow, they're using uh, stem cells derived from donor cord blood. So initially I had found out about the cord blood transplant from a blog that I found while searching for something to help Logan. I contacted that mom who unfortunately her son did pass away. He didn't uh, make it through the transplant. And she connected me with the doctors at Duke. The whole Duke bone marrow transplant team just took it from there. And it's not considered a treatment. It wasn't considered a trial, but they still offer it. The thing is, it's extremely risky. Mortality rate is very, very high you're risking their lives by doing it. Why is it so risky, the surgery itself? It's not really a surgery. It's 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 a process. So what happens is these kids, they go in, they do have surgeries because they have to get like a, a central line placed uh-huh. so they can hook everything up to these lines. And they receive two rounds of chemo, different types of chemo. They receive a drug along with the chemo. And the reason they get this is so it kills off their immune system completely. They need to just completely get rid of all those white blood cells. That way, when they receive the cord blood and the stem cells, the body doesn't reject it. The reason it's so risky is because obviously the chemo in itself, it's basically poison. One of the chemos that he had to get was called cytoxin. Having no immune system is extremely risky. Even though these kids are on a transplant floor that no one but the family is allowed on, we have to walk through like what I call the mud room, wash our hands, put uh, new shoes on, make sure we are completely clean before we came in. That That's one of the reasons it's so risky. The other reason it's so risky is once they receive the stem cell transplant, there is a chance that they get something called, they can get something called graft versus host disease. And that's pretty much when the body fights the new stem cells and it just, it attacks your body. Like it can attack anywhere. Hmm. So a lot of kids end up passing away due to graft versus host disease. It, it, it'll like go after their organs and it, it makes them really sick and they get organ failure and pass away. Is this still something they do on an ongoing basis for families that want to take a shot with it? It is, it is, but it is very difficult to qualify for it. They have to make sure the child is very healthy still. They haven't had a whole lot of damage done. Usually the cutoff age is three years old. So the child has to do all kinds of assessments and they have to do all kinds of studies to make sure everything, their full body, organs, everything is healthy. Because this process is so hard on the body, it, older San Felipe children just it yeah. it would yeah. kill them. You were saying that you had to bounce around to different communities, so you almost have to reestablish connections and probably teach these communities about your son each time you go. Did you find that to be challenging? How did it all work out for you? 
as a community? It's actually been really great. I find that most people are accepting and most people want to help and are supportive. That's one thing, really great thing about the military community. It's just really special, I guess, because we're all going through kind of the same thing. So everyone's just really welcoming and supportive. And it's not just when we move, it's anytime Billy changes a command. So we've been here in Washington for 10 years, but he's been to several different commands. And every time we switch, it's a whole new group of people. But the experience has been really great. Now, you were mentioning you have a good amount of respite care, which sounds like it's a huge advantage in the sense that it gives you the, the freedom and opportunity to, to also do other things, not only for your own mental health and physical well-being, but also I know you've been a big advocate of for military housing, and I'd like to hear how you got into that. It actually started with mold in our home, and uh, we live in military housing on the installation. And these private housing companies uh, team up with the uh, branches, so Navy, Army, Air Force, and they have contracts and they're partners. And just kind of a background for that. I had mold in my home and they weren't dealing with it properly. Uh, they weren't dealing with it at all. And I had reached out to an advocate group who were helping military families in uh, privatized housing. And that's how I got into that world. They helped me, they helped guide me, and I ended up getting my problem fixed. And then I wanted to join and pay it forward and help other families. When I got into it, I noticed that there was a huge need for families who have disabled family members. People weren't able to get reasonable accommodations for their homes. They were not, we had people who were wheelchair users who couldn't even get into their home because the companies wouldn't even approve accommodations for a ramp into their house, which is illegal. It's wild how bad it is. And so when I saw that, I took on the dis disability part of military housing and I took some classes. I got certified as a fair housing specialist. So I really knew what I was doing. And the group I was working with decided that we needed to get more organized. So we formed our own nonprofit that's now the Armed Forces Housing Advocates. And we have been doing all that we can to make changes. We work with Congress to get legislation in. That's really the best way to make change. We fundraise so that we can pay for reasonable accommodations for families. We were a huge part of helping families during the Hawaii water crisis. And we're just really loud so that the DOD and the private housing companies don't get away with the BS they've been getting away with for years. Doing something like that is taking a leadership position and you, you sort of have to be vocal and explain things to people. Is that something you were used to doing prior to taking on this role? Or did you feel like you really pushed yourself into an uncomfortable? I, I pushed myself into a very uncomfortable role. I remember the first time I went to a hearing in DC and a reporter from Military Times came over to interview me and I was shaking. I was not used to that. And uh, just, you know, I fake it till you become it is what pretty much what it turned into. So now I've done it so much that I'm used to it, but I, it was really scary at first, especially going up against the DOD and my husband mm -hmm. being active duty military. Yeah. So I was always worried that what I would do have an effect on him, but it turns out he can hold his own. So yeah, it was very uncomfortable. But that's also kind of what helped me get into this, you know, into TikTok yeah. and start doing that stuff. I do look at it as a gift to even have a platform to try new things that you wouldn't be able to try otherwise. Like I, I've been in the, a similar circumstance. I got to be part of this incredible campaign to raise awareness for Connor teach our whole community about San Felipe syndrome, but I had never led anything, but I also looked at it like, well, I get sort of nothing to lose by really trying to go for it with this San Felipe stuff. Cause if I don't do anything, it's like, I will, you know, 
nothing comes of it, but in we might as well give it a shot because it's a very safe environment to do it. You're allowed to yeah. fail and you're, you'll learn so much from failing anyway. And you only fail by doing and doing and doing, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So tell me about how that made you, I guess, more willing to put yourself out there on TikTok because you obviously have put yourself out there. You've shared a lot about your story and you've had to face, you have 3 million followers. You're going to have a lot of really shitty people out there who are going to throw some comments out there just to be a troll. So tell me about that experience. I have to say, I didn't expect that when we first started TikTok. I was actually really taken aback by that. And it took a long time to get used to the trolls. I would say doing what I did before in going up against, like I said, the DoD and these very big companies, it gave me confidence. Um, and, uh, but <laughs> the trolls, it was very shocking. It's very shocking what people will say behind a keyboard and being anonymous. So it actually scared me a little at first because I was getting threats of people are going to call CBS, things like that. And I was like, is that really a thing? So, but after, after like a few months of doing it, you, it's kind of sad, but you get desensitized to it almost. And you just have to learn to ignore it, but it still gets to you from time to time. You just have to kind of just try to scroll past, but sometimes it's also fun to respond to them in a snarky way. Yeah. Or I, my favorite thing is to turn it around and just try to respond in a positive way and educate them. Because I think a lot of comments too, that aren't necessarily trolls, but are, would be very negative. It's just ignorance. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can turn people around. There are a lot of parents like ourselves, you're thrust into this position of being a, a, you know, a parent with a kid who has a ticking time bomb, rare disease, and you just get out there and you find a way to fight, find your way to just get your foot in there and, and just contribute. What is a piece of advice that you would have for other mothers, you know, or, or fathers out there who are just looking to, you know, maybe newly diagnosed and are want to get out there, but are just kind of afraid to take that first step because they don't know, what do I do? Yeah. If, if, if you're meaning they want to like post, start a TikTok or anything like that, I would say just, just do it. The one thing you need to be prepared for though, you need to be prepared for the criticism. You're going to be criticized and you have to not take things personally. You just have to let it roll off. But I would say if you, if you're even thinking about it, then just, just try it, just try it out see if you like it, because that's what we did. We just one day, one day I was just like, all right, I'm just going to post, I'm just going to post the video. And it just like went crazy from there. Well, I know a lot of people have actually received diagnoses for San Felipe syndrome because they learned about the disease through you through TikTok, some, some way indirectly, if not from your son. Can you tell me one of those stories? Sure. So I have a lot of parents who have reached out to me and they've managed to get early diagnosis for their kids. But the one story that I do always think about is an aunt who reached out to me. She asked if she could send me a picture of her nephew because she suspected that he had San Filippo syndrome because he looked just like Logan. She said he was seven years old and he was diagnosed with autism, but recently uh, she said he would started to regress neurologically and physically, and they were concerned that it was something more, but the doctors were just like, no, sometimes with autism, you can regress. He's, he has autism. So later that night, she emailed me a picture of them and I was shocked that the doctors were sitting there saying that he only had autism. I mean, he had all of the features and not just, not just in the face. Like, you know, sometimes you see in Filippo kids, they have a certain type of body too. And he had it all. And I, I told her, I was like, you need, you, you need to tell them to get at the very least, get a urine test and get into a genesis. 
And I didn't hear back from her for a while, but then a couple months later, she messaged me and she said they got him into a genesis and they, he had San Filippo type A. And it's really sad because, you know, he was already seven years old, but because of that, they're able to get all of the support they need. And now they know what specialists they need to see. And now they know like what to look out for and what it's going to look like for them. They don't have to sit here and question it anymore. And while it's really sad, it's also a, probably a little bit of a relief to, to know. You could have possibly saved them five or six years of uncertainty, potentially. Yeah. The cloud of just trying to figure it out alone is a huge hassle and a financial strain too. trying to figure all that stuff out. For sure. Uh, one other topic I'd like to hear of, from you on is, you know, the loneliness and the isolation and depression of being a, a parent of a kid with San Filippo syndrome. Personally, I've had times in my, over the last few years that I've had like kind of big breakdowns. Like one time I shaved my head. It was just like, ah, get it out of my system. And, you know, I've, I've had therapists and I happen to have a therapist, a therapist now that I really like. She's taught me a lot about have, helping to deal with like those, those scary thoughts that come into your mind and just dealing with sort of mortality and, and death and these topics I never had to wrestle with before. Can you tell me how you've dealt with those demons? For sure. Yeah. And I'm really glad you asked this because mental health still carries such a huge stigma and people are almost ashamed to talk about it sometimes. And it's so important that we do, especially for parents in the situation that we're in, because we are stressed. Initially, when Logan was first diagnosed, I was in that kind of place. I am not, I don't need help. I'm not weak. I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to put it in the back of my head. And as the years went on, I found that that was not healthy at all. And my anxiety was getting worse and worse to the point to where it wasn't even manageable anymore. And that's when I found a great therapist. Throughout the years, I've kind of gone through some different ones at different phases of life. And I currently still am in therapy and it's so helpful because there are things I can't, I can't do it alone. I can't work things out alone. And it's really helped to have a therapist guide me. There have been phases of my life where I've been on medication to also help with depression and anxiety. You know, one thing I've learned about therapy is I, it really was tough at first to like have to tell, like, I feel like I'm burdening somebody by telling them my crap. And yes. that was such a, I would look every time I'd have to go to therapy, like, I, you know, say it was every Tuesday, I would just tense up and I would hate doing it. And then, but now I've learned that you can learn a lot of great tools and resources to help you deal with stuff. It's not necessarily about dumping your stuff on somebody, but learning from somebody because this is a really complicated thing that we're not equipped to deal with just with our own on our own you know exactly and yeah i agree i i do i felt like a burden too when i would have to do that you know asking for help that was my biggest thing asking people for help one because like you said i i did feel like a burden but two because i thought that it made me weak it made me look weak yeah. And I always tell people now, asking for help is a lot harder than not asking for help. So it's, you're not weak. You're, it's actually, you look stronger when you ask for help. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was like sort of peeling away those feelings or layers of shame that came with telling people about my like failures or problems but the more I've been able to kind of shed that that shamefulness, that's kind of unwarranted anyway, because we're just kind of dealt a different hand in life. But you don't right. think of it that way. You're like, oh, my friend over there has this and that. And I don't, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that, that was a big part. Let me see. Where can we go to learn more about any of your advocacy platforms or programs and even to we have a tiktok and an instagram and the handle is love underscore logan 07 and you can just find that anywhere online we also have a 
Facebook that's pretty successful and that's where we do most of our things. But yeah, that's where you would go. Okay, great. Well, Noel, I want to just thank you for taking the time and and you know, just always being a kind of an open and honest book and sharing your uh, your story. I, I know it means a lot to a lot of people out there, including myself.